Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. It's a real pleasure to be here with you. I'm Kurt Cacioppo, the guest composer here at the Carmel Bach Festival this year. And um, I, I imagine that some of you were at the concert yesterday and maybe got a little taste of <laughs> my music. And, um, and so what I'd like to do today is just uh, share a little more of my music with you and talk about uh, how I write it and how I promote it. And I'm going to play the piano a little bit for you. Uh, and we're going to try and do a little Sonne Lumiere here, uh, if the technology cooperates. Um, but I thought I'd start off by, by um, telling you about my invitation to the Carmel Bach Festival, how, how it came to be that uh, I was asked to write something for yesterday's concert. Um, and I was in Italy in November doing a series of performances. And when I got back, there was an email uh, on my computer here. And, uh, and it was from Paul Goodwin, who I had no idea who Paul Goodwin was, but <laughs> it was nice to have this email from him. <coughs> since he turned out to be a pretty great conductor. <laughs> um, and, um, and Paul, somehow or other, had become acquainted with my oboe concerto. He's an oboist, so I guess he checks these things out. And he, he came upon mine, and this oboe concerto that I had written maybe 10 years ago was for another festival like this, not a Bach festival, in America, but a Vivaldi festival in Venice. And, um, and there, it, it's a three movement concerto. It, it was premiered actually at the Church of the Pietà there on the Grand Canal where Vivaldi spent almost 40 years of his career. Yeah. Beautiful venue, I have to say. <laughs> um, and, um, and anyway, it's a three-movement concerto. Um, the deal was for that commission that <coughs> you could write a piece for the ensemble. Uh, it, you just had in some way to tie it into Vivaldi. And I based my composition on the Gloria, the famous Gloria of, of Vivaldi. And it had a slow movement. It has a slow movement, a largo. Um, and I think Paul was quite taken with that. And that's what uh, it inspired him to contact me to do this assignment here. I, I thought it might be nice to start off just by letting you hear a few minutes of what inspired him to contact me. So let's see if I can make this happen. There we are. OK, I'm going to wind it back to the very beginning.
Well, that gives you some idea of uh, the, uh, of the music that Paul was listening to uh, that motivated him to contact me. So I was very delighted to receive his email and to get involved with the Carmel Bach Festival, <coughs> which I had known about for many years. In fact, one of my mentors collaborated with this festival back in the late 1980s, I think. George Rockwear, maybe somebody remembers that project. Um, well, Italy is a big source of inspiration for me. And this is one of many pieces that in some way describe or respond to the imagery of Venice in particular. I love Venice. And in this I was trying to, to capture that feeling of uh, weightlessness and, and floating and uh, you know around noontime or one, one in the afternoon and the clouds part very gradually and the sun shines through on the water of the canal. There's a color of blue-green that I don't think can be seen anywhere else in the world. And that color, just that color, you know. And trying to reproduce it with these chords that you hear in the beginning of this. Kind of blurring, intentionally blurring these uh, simple triads which are major triads, most of them, but blurring them and sustaining them in a way that, that uh, I don't know, translates that color and that feeling of weightlessness. And, and I love the architecture there and the, the, the Eastern influence. And I uh, oh, wish, wish we were all there right now. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> um, yeah, this festival was at Vivaldi Festival. It was a great honor to, uh, to have the premiere in that church, the Chiesa della Pietà, uh, right there on the Grand Canal. And it was a huge audience, too. And then they recorded it and broadcast it on the, on the Italian radio all throughout the country. And then, you know, they picked that up in Switzerland and the south of France, too. Um, and so it was all very exciting. And at that concert, now this is, I'm just remembering this, at that concert, two members of the String Quartet of Venice came backstage to talk to me. And, uh, and we became friends right then and there. And we've collaborated ever since that time. This is, you know, this is one of Italy's the most renowned uh, string quartets, classical music ensembles, and they are the heirs apparent um, of the Quartetto Italiano. Uh, those, those guys were their teachers. And, um, and so they asked me not long after we met if I would write them a string quartet for their 20th anniversary tour. And, um, and I was happy to. And they assigned the, uh, the program. Uh, they said it should be Impressions of Venice. Impressions of Venice. Well, I mean, how could I not write that? <laughs> so, um, and they played that all over the place. Uh, and they recorded it, and we'll get to that a little bit later, or just the very beginning of it. Actually, I'm now writing a piece for their 30th anniversary year, which is in 2013. Um, the String Quartet of Venice, the Quartetto di Venezia, um, and I played a concert together last year at a festival in Germany uh, in, the, in the Hartz region. Some of you probably have been there. This is where uh, what's on what used to be the East German border. And, uh, and 
not so far south from Brahms's stomping grounds. Uh, it's not that far from Hamburg and uh, close to Hanover. Anyway, we were there for this festival and the whole theme of the festival was Venice. And uh, so, and so they play, it was great for me because I played a piece, a solo piece, and then, um, and then they played my quartet. Uh, and so I got to sit there for the first half, or most of it, and listen to my quartet. And so it was nice. And then we had to get to work, and we played the Brahms F minor quintet, which if you know that piece, uh, especially for piano, uh, it's very demanding. Um, but we had, a, we had a great time with it. And in fact, I think we got eight curtain calls and we had to play the scherzo again, which is, of course, the hardest movement <laughs> for the pianist. And, um, but yeah, we had a great time. And after the concert, they said, well, you know, it's gonna be our 30th anniversary in 2013. Would you write us a quintet and come and play it? You know? So that's what I'm working on now. Um, and I'm almost finished with it. And I don't know, I might even finish it here uh, in the next week. Uh, well, I can, tell you, I can tell you the theme of it. I can tell you the theme of it. It's another program piece. Um, and it took me a long time to arrive at a theme that really worked for me. If you know, if you're chamber music fans and you're asked the question, how many piano quintets are there? Um, how many great piano quintets are there? <coughs> we have Schumann, which is a fabulous piece, and then we have Brahms. And then we have Franck, and we have Jacques, there, there are maybe, yeah, maybe half a dozen, you know, really great piano quintets, and that's about it. But the Brahms is not a piano quintet. I mean, it's another symphony. Brahms, uh, Brahms in his chamber music sometimes makes you want to hear the whole brass section come in, you know, with timpani and so I mean, he writes symphonies. It doesn't matter how many instruments are playing, <laughs> you know? And, and that is such a great piece of music, and you have to practice it so hard. And it just gets into you. It takes over your life. So uh, th this time last year, I was steeped in Brahms, and... Uh, it took a while just to get that out of my system, to write my own piano quintet and come to terms with what I might like to hear in a relationship between four string players and a, and a pianist, you know? So it took a while to get going on this thing. But um, it's a, it's, it will be a seven movement piece, probably a half hour. And uh, it's about the women who were at the crucifixion. And it's, it's they're not really portraits of these women. Um, they're s sort of meditations on, on these women, what they might have been, what might have been going through their minds and their, and their emotions at the time of the crucifixion. So, uh, so I have one more to go. I did, uh, I did Mary Full of Grace. That's the first movement. That's very serene, except that, uh, have you ever seen this picture of Mary of Sorrows? That has the heart exposed and there are seven daggers in it. You've seen this? Well, that's what I try to depict in this, in this uh, piece about Mary full of grace. So the piano is 
the is the element that conveys the uh, serenity of Mary. But the strings come in with these vehement pizzicatos where you slap the string on the fingerboard. And, um, and then these glissandos kind of bleed away from those attacks. And there are seven of those for the seven daggers. So that's that movement. And then the, the next movement is about, well, she wasn't exactly at the cross, but um, Claudia Focula, the wife of Pontius Pilate, who in, in Matthew's account uh, has this dream, uh, which causes her to advise her husband to have nothing to do with the blood of that righteous man. That's fascinated me since I was 18, I think. Um, so I, I finished that movement. Then, um, then there's Veronica, who wipes the face of Christ, and then on the on the cloth is uh, uh, recorded his image, the true image of Christ like the Shroud of Turin. There are a few of these textiles around. Uh, I think there's one in Shark also. Uh, and that actually is based on a passage from the St. Matthew Passion. What's it, they're doing St. Matthew Passion here next year? Yeah? yeah. Wow. My favorite moment in the St. Matthew Passion is uh, when the choir sings, Wahrlich ist dieser Gottes Sohn gewesen. Truly, this was the Son of God. It's two measures. It's obviously late in the in the piece. It's two measures for choir, and to me, the whole structure of the St. Matthew Passion revolves around those two measures. So somehow this idea of truth and the true image of Christ and Veronica, who by some definitions, her name means, you know, true icon. <coughs> um, uh, I, I just was drawn to, to that a couple of measures in the Bach, and then I base this movement on that. Then, uh, then there's Mary Magdalene, and uh, and the one that I'm still working on is the other Mary. There was a third Mary. We don't know very much about her, so I have to use my imagination a little bit more just to come up with a program. But I think, I think I've got that now. I just need to write it. Then Salome, not the Oscar Wilde Salome, but <laughs> another Salome who was there at the crucifixion and who was the mother of James and John. Um, and then the last movement is is about St. James and St. John, the Sons of Thunder. How could I not write a piece with the title Sons of Thunder? I mean, that's, that's a great way to finish off the quintet. And, and at the same time, carry the thread into the younger generation from these women who were mothers at the crucifixion, and, and then in Salome's case, anyway, to their offspring. Um, so that, that movement's finished, too. They have all those. They're waiting on the third Mary. <laughs> and I'm feeling the pressure, so. <laughs> I don't know exactly where or when the premiere will be, but they want to premiere it over there in Italy, possibly 
uh, at the, uh, possibly at the American Academy. Um, we're working on that, or they're working on that. I'm busy writing the last piece. Um, so I have other sources of inspiration too. Um, you know, we were at the Steinbeck Museum the other day and we saw this film that had Elaine Steinbeck talking about uh, a stage production in France of, uh, of Mice and Men and how when the curtain went up, she was horrified and, and the, the sets were all wrong and they didn't know what they were doing, knew nothing about Salinas or anything. But then when the people started the dialogue, she said, none of that mattered. Uh, they totally understood what, uh, what the drama was about and what the issues were and related to them on a human level. And, and, and uh, she said it reinforced the idea that John was not writing about any particular locality. He was writing about people. He was writing about people. It didn't matter if they're in France or Salinas. <clears throat> and that impressed me, and it made me wonder, uh, you know, you go to a museum like this, and if you're a creative person, you just inevitably start to measure yourself against whoever the, the person is that the museum is dedicated to. How do I stand up, or am I like this person? in any way, um, how am I different? That just made me think uh, <coughs> one great uh, motivation uh, in my writing is people. Uh, I write for people, I write about people. And uh, I've written a lot of dedications actually. In fact, a few years ago I had a concert program that was all dedications. And the first half was uh, music that I had written and dedicated to other fellow musicians or family members or friends or, and then the second half uh, was some, uh, pieces of music that had been dedicated to me or written for me as a, as a pianist. Uh, uh, so I'd like to maybe play some examples at the piano.
maybe I'll play another piano piece. Shall I do another piano piece? Okay. Um, we can uh, we can talk then for a second about this collection of pieces I did maybe two or three years ago called Philadelphia Diary. Philadelphia Diary. We have a really great uh, chamber music series in Philadelphia. Uh, the Philadelphia Chamber Music Society. And uh, they are very uh, vigorous about commissioning uh, composers in the Philadelphia area. So they asked me to write a piano piece. Um, and I decided, well, you know, Philadelphia and uh, uh, the sites and so on. I decided to do a Philadelphia diary. And uh, so the first movement is about uh, a, a famous tree, Fam famous tree, which actually you see in an old Benjamin West painting. This is a tree that's, uh, that's known as the Treaty Elm. And under this elm tree, back in 1668 or something, when was it? 1668. William Penn and a Lenape Indian named Tamanand um, forged a peace treaty so that their two peoples could live compatibly. And, um, and so the first movement of my Philadelphia diary, which has five pieces in it, um, the first movement of the Philadelphia diary is about this treaty elm. Uh, the title of it is Under the Treaty Elm, and the subtitle is And the Leaves of the Tree Are for the Healing of the Nations, which is a line from Revelation. In this, I, I was writing about people also, not, uh, not just about place. Um, and in this, I put together a Lenape melody with a melody that had sort of been appropriated into the Quaker song repertoire, which has to do with, uh, uh, with uh, the, the unfettered uh, impulse to sing. And in a, in a kind of contrapuntal way, uh, I put these two, two elements together, Lenape tune and a Quaker tune. So, under the treaty elm.
think. Um, I'd like to stay with the Philadelphia Diary and uh, play another piece. And this piece is called Old Swedes. But it's really about Sicily. Uh, the Swedes kind of appropriated the legend of Santa Lucia uh, for themselves, and um, their church ritual revolves around the, the, um, the personage of, of St. Lucy. There was a group of Swedish immigrants back in the 1600s, again, that built a famous wooden church in Philadelphia, uh, not, uh, not far from the river. And um, that church uh, is still there today. Well, it's been rebuilt uh, a couple of times since those days, but um, it's still very active. And you know, every December, they they enact uh, the ritual of, of Saint Lucy. But there's another church um, in Syracuse, in Sicily, which is dedicated to Saint Lucy. And uh, as I was writing about the Swedish church, I was being tugged toward Syracuse. And so there's a lot of uh, Santa Lucia uh, in this. And in fact, the piece, the piece is secretly based on that famous song. Yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you. Okay, so now in the remaining time, maybe we'll take a trip back to Venice. Uh, I wanted to show you what, uh, what my recording company is doing these days. I released the quartet that I um, told you about earlier with the Venice String Quartet on a label called Navona Records, by Piazza Navona. Well, that's in Rome, but whatever. <laughs> um, and Navona Records is producing contemporary classical CDs that include what they call enhanced content. So you buy the disc, and then you insert it into your computer, and you can listen to the tracks as you normally would, but you can also open up a, a whole package of media material. So you can see the scores to the music and follow them as the music plays. You can see artist biographies. Uh, you can see, in some cases, um, recording sessions, uh, videos of recording session segments, uh, interviews with composers, and all kinds of things. Um, in my case, because all of the music was so visual, there wasn't enough room on the actual disc to include all this material. So Navona decided they would simply tell you inside the CD, in the uh, digipack, to go to this website where you can access all kinds of material, the digital booklet, the slideshows, uh, the scores, uh, wallpaper, uh, <laughs> all this, all this, you know, merchandising kind of stuff. And so I just wanted to show you, if I can operate this, you know, what they're trying to do. And uh, they were very excited about, about this project. And um, uh, let's see. I have to go down here. We'll get rid of that. Then we'll open Firefox again. Okay, and then, so let's say you, you purchase the CD, which is called Italia. You purchase the CD, and you insert it into your computer, and you can listen to it. But then you can also go to this website, right, right there. Italia web content. Okay, so that's the String Quartet of Venice playing Impressions of Venice, and this is sort of the home page for, the, for this uh, website. Then, we're having a little trouble with the sizing of this, but uh, I think you get a pretty clear idea of what it's all about. There's that water that I was talking to you about before. That was a very special moment. I never have seen it quite that way ever again. And this is across from the Isle of St. George. Um, and that's the, uh, the Palladian Church of uh, San Giorgio Maggiore. Wonderful place. Uh, all right, yeah, and the umbrella uh, company is Parma Recordings. And uh, so they, they like Italy a lot too. So it's Parma Recordings, and there's Navona Records, and then there's another branch of it called Ravello Records, and all this. So, yeah, so here if you click on that, you'll see scores. Here I recorded some verbal commentaries and there's also a YouTube video that you link to there where I talk about this quartet. Then there's a digital booklet with lots of nice pictures in it, beautiful pictures in two languages. It's bilingual, so it's in Italian and 
English. Then you can go to this slideshow thing. Let's see, get a little more image there. And you click on whichever piece you want to hear. So the title um, uh, piece is Impressions of Venice. Uh, then there's a set of pieces about Tuscany on the road of the Seven Bridges, which we, where we used to live. We lived for a year on this road outside of Arezzo. <coughs> and then you can hear this uh, ensemble piece uh, called Red Dove of Libya, um, which deals with a legend. I'll just say one little word about it. It deals with a legend of uh, the cult of Venus in Erice in Sicily. Mm -hmm. Was the inspiration for uh, Tannhäuser. It's the Venus bird. Yeah, a long history going back to the Phoenicians. Uh, okay, so let's do a slideshow. How about on the road of the seven bridges? for a year. We started off in Amsterdam and slowly made our way to Italy. We spent some time in Austria looking at Mozart stuff. And so that's Mozart's birthplace. And this piece also begins in Salzburg. So it's a little bit in Mozart style and gradually evolves into something else. young family, really young. <laughs> That's where he was born, yeah. And these are the Dolomites. Sometimes the pictures alternate with the page of music that you're hearing and kind of fade in and out. This is also in the Dolomites. Uh, we're getting closer to Italy though. trumpets here sort of match the music and we're in Florence. These, this is a detail from one of the baptistry doors. This is the Palio of Siena. got a little gritty there because you know the palio can get pretty uh, violent. The rider doesn't even have to finish the race. They don't care about him, just the horse. <laughs> lived in the uh, Contrada district of the, of the tower. The elephant and castle is their symbol. But that gives you some idea of 
what's in this uh, website. All right, let's close out. And, um, well, I thought, you know, if maybe you have some questions, I could answer a couple of questions in the remaining time. Uh, Yes. How, how do you create a path? I mean, you get an inspiration for a piece, and how does it come to you? Do you look at it like a writer? Do you, do you kind of set it down? How do you, how do, you do that? Well, every project is a little bit different. Uh, so the method is a little bit different each time. Um, and sometimes, uh, well, in a lot of these examples, there's the visual inspiration. And I suppose you could say you, you start out attempting to translate from one medium into another until you come up with some actual musical content that you can work with. Um, but sometimes you're setting a text, and the text uh, already has embedded in it uh, imagery and rhythm and so forth, and you kind of uh, mine the, the specific content of the text and turn it into something that can be used musically. Um, or sometimes uh, you get uh, you get a pass, you know, a passage comes to you and it's fully formed and you just write it down. Um, and you're able to do that because you've been working in this way for a long time and uh, the process starts to become second nature and you're just a medium. Now that's what Stravinsky said about the rite of spring. It's a, it's a great statement, you know. I was the vessel through which the rite of spring passed. <laughs> so it's great to be a vessel. Uh, <laughs> is there another question? Yeah, um, if, um, if you're writing for a Baroque ensemble, you, uh, you have to respect uh, a, a shorter range uh, for each group of string instruments and uh, you have to keep in mind that their tuning system is different, that the resonance of the uh, instrument is, is different and so you consider how, how that will affect projection in a large concert hall. You know, they use a different kind of bow. Uh, I'm talking about strings because my piece happened to be for string. <coughs> they use uh, gut strings. They don't use uh, nylon or steel strings. Um, they don't use uh, so much vibrato except when they're making a crescendo. So yeah, and, but an and that's the case with anything that you write. You have to uh, understand the, what you have to understand what is idiomatic for the group of instruments or in the case of vocal music for the the, the particular voice or voices that you're writing for. And, may, and in a lot of cases there for the person that you're writing for, the specific singer. I've written quite a bit of, uh, of vocal music at this point and um, I've, I've had in mind a lot of times a particular singer, a particular voice when I'm writing for for their uh, special capabilities, their special qualities. Maybe one more question, yes. Uh, the piece that I did for the festival is actually derived from Bach. Because, uh, yeah, because, uh, well, that was my assignment. <laughs> um, but, right, I've done a lot of, of music connected with uh, American Indians and 
I did a series of string quartets that traced the Navajo creation story from the first emanations of light to the, uh, to the adventures of Monster Slayer who rids the world of all these horrible beings and makes it, uh, uh, well, paves the way for human habitation. I just finished that last year. It's a, it was a you know, long-term project and uh, each piece was a commission for a major professional string quartet. Uh, and they're all recorded now. And the one that was premiered last year uh, is soon to be released. It'll come out in November, actually. I just have a long-standing interest in, uh, in Native American studies from childhood and it's something that's grown and become part of my creative life and my teaching life and, uh, and my research life I guess you could say. Um, so there was a little Native American melody in that Philadelphia Diary piece. Uh, the Lenape Indians are the tribe that, uh, that uh, occupied and still uh, is living in the Delaware Valley. And I did a whole symphony dedicated to the Lenape back in 2009. Uh, and in that, I wrote a part for myself, uh, a singing part and a drumming part, because I sing those songs in Indian style. And so, and I actually use Lenape language in that too. So it sounds kind of strange, I guess. But. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, fundamentally different. Uh, the concepts that we have of harmony don't apply. Uh, the way the music figures into the broader structure of society doesn't apply. It's not entertainment. It's something more central. In the Navajo, for instance, the, they don't really have a word for music. But the word that's used to refer to something like a song is uh, the same word that means divinity. And so there's a kind of big and deep concepts and differences. But just in the way the music is sounded, uh, the idea of scales, we have scales on the piano here. We have, you know, seven notes, seven white notes, and, and that makes a scale. And uh, when you think about it, that's pretty limited. You know, what's in between those notes? If there are other pitch, other frequencies in between those notes, then, <coughs> as in a lot of ethnic music, uh, the American Indian singing utilizes all of them. Yeah, I mean, you could just say they have a lot of pitch bend, but they're really kind of exploring all these, all these finer increments. Um, it's fascinating. Well, it's really fascinating. It has sustained me for decades. And, and I can speak with some authority about it, but I'm really a student of that tradition. Well, I'm a student of Bach, too. Because it's every day you learn something new. There are over 600 tribes in just in the United States. And of those, uh, a couple hundred have sovereign relations with the United States government. Uh, there are six fundamental language stocks. There are hundreds of languages. And many of them mutually unintelligible. Lenape is is a 
a language that belongs to a population of, I don't know, maybe 15,000. And those people are subject to a diaspora, so some of them are in the Philadelphia area, and some of them are in upstate New York, and some are in Ohio, and some are in Oklahoma, and they're, they're very spread out. Uh, only a small fraction of them speak their language. I'm, I'm sort of involved in a uh, linguistics group that uh, is uh, trying to protect these indigenous languages that are on the verge of extinction. There are about 90 of these languages. At Swarthmore College, they actually teach Lenape now. In fact, you can go to the Swarthmore website. See, I'm doing an ad for our competitors. Uh, <laughs> you could go to the SWAT uh, website and, you know, fish around a little bit. You can see them doing little conversational episodes in Lenape. Uh, and it's quite exciting that, uh, that this uh, this uh, element of human culture is is being preserved, and not just being preserved, but being put to use. This was the case when we were living up uh, in uh, Cambridge. I got involved with the Wampanoag. And, uh, and their language was almost extinct. But then there was this woman who was having dreams uh, in a language she couldn't understand. And Noam Chomsky found out about this and invited her to Harvard. And it turned out she was having dreams in Wampanoag. And they created a whole program around her to, uh, to and so now they, they're teaching Wampanoag to, to that population. And that's another small population. I don't know what the most recent count is, but maybe 12,000 people, maybe. Um, anyway, a fascinating thing. It's been tremendous inspiration sort of my big my big affinities are for Italy and India. <laughs> uh, so. Well, thank you all for being here. It's been my pleasure. Enjoy the festival.